wonderful to see you so engaged oh, already. Good. I think you would love this one. Well, this for Dean Sons, our series. Dr. Jeff Mars is going to give us a talk today. Um, you know, Dr. Marvel, let me just highlight some of the things that to me make her so phenomenal. Um, her research, of course, is on um, plant ecology and evolution, plant fungal interactions and native and invasive plants, which interests me a great deal because I'm trying to put a native wildlife into my current home. It'll be my fifth one in five states, so I'm pretty oh, yeah. excited about that. So I'm going to be all ears. I'm pulling the buzz over it here. Um, plant pollinator interactions and restoration psychology. ecology. Um, one of the things that impressed me when I first came here was Doug's commitment to undergraduate education. He's been long with us as scholars. And I was staggered when I looked back at her record. In the last six years, she's mentored 21 undergraduate research projects. Wow. 11 of them presented at professional, regional, or national biology conferences. 12 of them presented their research at undergraduate research conferences at IU South Bend, the IU Research Conference, Argonne National Labs, at the LCM, and a paper that she co-authored with undergraduates was recently accepted in the journal Proceedings of the Indiana Academy of Sciences. I could go on, but I want you to hear from her because I know this is going to be so very good. So please give your attention to Del Mar and have some questions. Yay! Um, thank you. So it's um, I'm really delighted to be able to share some of the work that we've been doing, um, and mostly. I, so I have two parts to my research. One part of my research is really thinking about endophytic fungi. So fungi have a whole set of microbiome fungi and bacteria that live within them, and trying to identify who's there because we don't actually know a lot. So every time. If you want to find a new species, just start trying to isolate fungi from plants. Um, and then figure out what they do. Are they parasitic? Are they mutualistic? Are they commensalistic? Meaning neutral effects, positive effects, negative effects. And then in particular, what I'm interested in that kind of work is what are the fungi that are in plants in native plants and in non-native plants, and how does that affect the interaction between them? So that's one part. The other part of uh, research that I do is in respiration ecology. And today I'm going to focus on the restoration ecology part, and in particular focus on, on uh, projects that we've been doing on campus. Um, and uh, so we're going to focus just on campus, and we're going to think some. Uh, so I uh, think about landscapes, and when we think about landscapes, sometimes you think about, about them as a backdrop, a snapshot in time. And what I'm going to do is think about species interactions, what's happening in the soils, between the soils and the plants, what's happening between the plants and the pollinators, and then also what's happening at higher trophic levels, the birds. So, three parts to the talk, three different studies. I'm highlighting, um, I chose some highlights from a number of different studies and kind of put them together into these three parts. So we're going to start on the ground. Uh, so first, we are over in north side, so we're going to come across the pedestrian bridge. There's a wetland restoration to the west of the bridge, cleverly called the West Pond, and then to the east of the bridge, there's another one called the East Pond. And um, in 2011, um, Andy and I wrote a number of grants, both external and internal, to get funding to restore these into wetlands. And so this is what the ponds looked like in 2011. So there was grass that was being mowed up towards uh, the edge. Um, and these, which we still have. Um, so this project was very much Andy and I together doing this restoration project. I, at this point, I think I've worked on every single biology faculty member has put in some sweat equity. <laughs> Louise has put in some sweat equity. Anyway, if you want to help, we've, we've got room for muscle. So we first planted in 2011. So we tilled the soil, we sowed seeds, we put in plugs. We also put in goose netting fencing around. So here's Ann Grant's. Um, and so trying to keep the geese out from eating all the seeds. So one of the things that we noticed, this is um, the grass near the east wetland, and one of the things that I want to point out, this is bare soil. Not even the grass grows over there. So uh, it's been really difficult getting plants to establish. Um, we have had some establishments, some things have come in just fine, but in terms of the full diversity of what we've planted, it's been difficult. So, that's so over the past 135 years, there's a lot that has happened across the river. It was a 
trolley park. It was a casino and an exhibition hall. There was a roller coaster apparently at some point. A racetrack, an amusement park. Uh, the racetrack actually had, yeah, well, anyway, you, you know what racetracks do. Golf course. Um, and then in 2008, uh, student housing. So for a very long time, there hasn't been native plants over there. The soil is very disturbed. The soil, that is there, there's very little topsoil at all. Now the reason why this matters for restoration is because of the microbiome. So as I mentioned at the beginning, there's a whole suite of bacteria and fungi that live within plants. That's called the endophytic microbiome. There's also the soil micro microbiome. So there's bacteria, fungi, and viruses that are in the soil. And these matter in terms of supporting plants. If that microbiome isn't there, you can put the seeds in, but they're not going to grow and establish. And this is more important for more specialized plants, longer-lived plants, and some native plants. So um, what we did in 2017, I decided to focus on restoring microbiomes uh, is becoming a thing, but there's a lot of unknowns. We don't even know a lot of time what is in the soil. So we, uh, in 2017, I decided to focus on mycorrhizal fungi, or buscular mycorrhizal fungi. Um, this is a particular suite of fungi that are associated with plants. The majority of plants have these interactions with these fungi. It's a very old symbiosis. So based on the fossil record, this dates back 300 million years. Um, <clears throat> this is looking at a seedling here. This is a pine seedling. This is the root structure. So for example, these are plant roots. And then all these fine threads, those are the fungal hyphae. So what the fungal hyphae do, so the fungi extend their hyphae out into the soil, accessing more nutrients and bringing that into the plant. If we look at one of these roots over here, so here's one of these roots, this is the epidermis cortex, the vascular tissue within the root, all of this dark staining is the fungi. Mm -hmm. So the fungi are bringing nutrients into the roots, the arbuscles, which look like little trees inside of the cells, that's where the nutrient exchange takes place. The plants are providing sugars for the fungi, the fungi are providing nutrients for the plant. Um, in addition to that, there are other benefits. So when you have these mycorrhizal fungi with the plants, this increases the chemical complexity of the plant. So it increases their ability to withstand drought. It increases their ability to uh, ward off herbivores, so animals eating the plants, and also pathogens, so other fungi that are trying to get into the plants. So there's a whole suite of things that these mycorrhizal fungi do. And the majority of plants have these interactions. So what we did in 2017, um, there was a crew of us, so there's Brenna, Tyler, Sky, and Alex, and me. Um, the first thing that we decided to do is see, okay, what do we know about the mycorrhizal fungi on campus compared to area restorations? So at that point, our restoration was about five years old. Um, and then we also look at Bendix Woods, which has a prairie restoration about 17 years old at that time. And then Prairie Winds, which is just south of here, um, also had a, a prairie that was established in 2000. So both of these are in St. Joseph County. Both of these restorations are doing pretty well. They've also been more uh, longer established. Um, so we collected soils from each of these, and then we started counting. Um, well, OK, so we collected the soils. We sieved the soils for the mycorrhizal spores. Uh, so you can um, use sieves in, um, that have different grid sizes. And so we collected spores from 125 micron to 63 and 45 micron. That's pretty small. So um, one millimeter, which is about the width of maybe your nail, has 1,000 microns. So this would be 0.125 millimeters. So we're talking small. This is where we're at the microscopes. Um, and there's a diversity of these spores. So you can tell the spores apart. They're, the shape, the color, size, texture. Um, sand grains are angular, not circular. So, so we counted. Um, in two teaspoons of soil, there was twice as many mycorrhizal spores in the prairie wind soil compared to Bendix on campus. Bendix had more spores, about a little over 600, I think it was about 640 spores on average campus, about five. So we are finding more spores in another uh, soil. So we then set up a greenhouse experiment. So this is a photograph of 
the greenhouse, and we focused in 2017 on two plant species of grass, for drop seed, and then a four wild quinine. Um, and we planted seedlings in these pots, and then we put them in the three different types of soils. So we, and then we took root samples. Um, so this is a root that does not have mycorrhizal fungi associated with it. This is a root that does have those mycorrhizal structures. And so we compared these plants in the campus soil, prairie winds, and Bendix soils, and looked at over three weeks, this is a short period, um, and, and looked at how did colonization. So mainly to see if we put plants in these different kinds of soils, could we affect mycorrhizal fungi. So here's the results from that. Um, so we did initial samples, so less than 5% um, of the root, about 3% of the root had mycorrhizal fungi initially. When we put them into the soils, um, there was an increase, particularly in the prairie winds. Not statistically significant, but this was only over three weeks. And the fact that we were able to increase, particularly in the soils that had high numbers of spores, was kind of proof of concept that you could put these plant seedlings in different kinds of soils and increase mycorrhizal. So in 2018, um, we did an experiment. So this one is with um, Andy Schnabel, David Mitchell, and Jesse Jones. And we decided to focus on six plant species that are harder to establish. So there are conservation values that are assigned to all native plants. So within this region, um, these conservation values range from zero to ten. Zero means it can grow anywhere. Ragweed is a zero. <laughs> but you can grow it in a roadside ditch, you could grow it in your yard, you could grow it in the prettiest <coughs> garden ever. It grows anywhere. It doesn't have a lot of site fidelity. A ten <laughs> means I can grow ragweed. Uh, but maybe not even in the soils over there. But anyway. Uh, but a ten <coughs> means that you're only going to find those plants in high quality natural areas. And that they have very high site fidelity. They tend to have very specific habitat requirements. When you do restorations, typically you can get conservation values up to maybe four or five, but it's really hard to get the full diversity of plants established. So getting those higher conservation values are more difficult. I think it's partly the microbiome that's missing, that just doesn't support those plants. So we chose six plants um, that had higher conservation values. And we set up an experiment, well, so first we, um, so we had three soil additions. We did whole soil addition treatments. Um, so in 2018, we collected soils from different areas. We also counted the number of mycorrhizal spores to make sure we knew what we were dealing with. Again, prairie winds, winds. Um, so it had about three times more spores, mycorrhizal spores, and two tablespoons of soil compared to campus or compost. The compost is from uh, the west side of town, the city compost uh, resource. Um, and so we uh, planted the plants with one of these three soil treatments. The soil treatments were randomly assigned. We had 36 plots, so roughly 12 plots per soil treatment. Within each of these plots, uh, we have the different plant species within there, and at the base, when we plant it, we put two tablespoons of soil, and then we put the plant. <coughs> so, um, all randomized. There was a lot of labor involved in that. <laughs> so, it was started last summer, 2018. And um, so then after eight weeks, uh, we didn't collect roots from everything. We were really concerned about in the first year, so these are plants that grow more slowly, but in the first year they're putting all their energy into root growth. Um, and so we were concerned that if we um, harvested from all of them, we just might kill all of them. So we did subsampling, um, and this was only after eight weeks, which is fairly short for this kind of experiment. But anyway, so this is looking at percent change in mycorrhizal colonization for Lobelia syphilitica, and then Pycnanthemum uh, virginianum, so that's mountain mint, smells lovely. Um, no difference between any of the soil treatments yet. So this is after eight weeks. Um, and then in terms of percent plant biomass, after 13 weeks, so in the fall we harvested all the plants to see if there was differences in growth between the treatments. 
Um, this is looking, and we did this for all the plant species. So for gentians and um, silphium, uh, terrapin, magnesium, so this is a prairie dock here. Um, again, no difference after 13 weeks, but these plants are slow growing. So this, so last year was just the first year, so we're continuing this. And, and personally, I wouldn't really expect to see differences maybe until year two, year three. So this next summer, we'll again look at the mycorrhizal uh, fungi in the roots. We'll also look at biomass. Um, and also start looking at reproduction. So are they flowering and reproducing? To see if these soil treatments make a difference. So what we're trying to do is establish some of these rarer, more highly conserved species so that we can increase the diversity of plants in these restorations. So what do we know from this? Um, we know that the campus soils are missing some of the native plant microbiome, and this is making it difficult to establish. Um, <coughs> We are using native uh, soils from around here, so we're not introducing soils from elsewhere to see if that makes a difference. In the greenhouse experiment, we can increase the amount of the root that's colonized by the mycorrhizal fungi. In the field experiment, no significant effect of these soil treatments on plant survival or growth yet, but stay tuned. And we'll see. Um, so that's the soils. Now I'm going to move to the pollinators. So when you establish the native plants, they support pollinators. Um, and the studies that I'm going to focus on here were done by a couple of different students. So this is Sarah Tabner, David Mitchell, and Jesse Jones. So this is from 2016, 2017, and 2018. Um, in terms of bee diversity, so in North America, there's 4,000 species of bees, at least. In Indiana, there's at least 416 species of bees that have been documented. Um, there's probably some bees out there that we don't know about. The bees are really wonderful. This is Perdita, a little fairy bee. And this <laughs> is a carpenter bee. So the huge difference in their faces are so amazing. Um, in mm -hmm. terms of are they in decline, I can say probably, definitely yes. But for the most part, we don't know because we don't even know the abundance. So even just figuring out are they here is sort of one level of question and then knowing what the abundance is. We do know that for bombus, uh, so bumblebees, that about 30% of those species are in decline, and that's based on the herbarium specimens. So um, I just wanted to show you, these are some photos from campus. So this is spiderwort, transcantia. Um, these are photos that David took with his cell phone. Wow. Students are amazing with their cell phone. Um, and just to give you a flavor for some of the different kinds of bees that we're seeing. So honeybees, of course. We've got a honeybee hive on campus. Um, a couple of different species of these green sweat bees, so Agapostoma and Agapora. Um, multiple species of bombus, so bumblebees, early guys. And then lastly, the blossom. Now look at this. This is the flower. Uh, the anther, it's kind of curled around the anther, so you compare that to like the bumblebees or the honeybees. So we have uh, some different uh, species of bees, nectar robber bees. So these guys, these big burly guys, they chew a hole in the base of the flower. They uh, get the nectar, but they don't pollinate. Bad. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think about things from the perspective of the plants. Uh, there's also a lot of flies that are out there um, as well. Um, so what we did is we reported observations from six different plant species. So Milkweeds, iris, penicillin, beard's tongue, obedient plant, physostegia. Uh, this is cup plant, so a silphium, and then this is the tritoscantia that I just showed you. Um, here's what we found. So in terms, this is showing pie charts of the different kinds of floral visitors that were coming. Um, and then the N means the number of observations reported for that flower. So this was a whole group of us, right, four of us we observed lots over uh, time. So that's the number of observations. For, and the, it, there's differences between species because some flower longer. Uh, some we caught at the tail end. Um, so irises started earlier in May than when we got started last year. Um, but the key takeaway from this one, I think, is two. So some of these plant species are supporting a much greater diversity of pollinators. So the milkweeds and the irises. Mm -hmm. Grand Central Station. Everybody comes to this. For some of these others, like the beard's tongue, tradescantia, and so forth, it's mostly bees and flies that are coming. 
multiple different species of these, but uh, a smaller suite. Um, Sarah Tabner, um, in this study, we took a different method. So bees have a different uh, vision than um, we do. So we see more the red to blue range. Uh, bees are shifted to shorter wavelengths, so more yellow to UV. So um, we use these bee cups. Yellow is actually, we had to use two different colors of yellow, a fluorescent yellow and a solid yellow. Um, and then blue, this is a, a fluorescent blue, so we're sort of getting the range of the, what they see and attract them. And then at the base of these cups, so you hang them at the level of the flowers, put a little bit of water and a little bit of soap at the bottom. So they come, they're attracted to the color, and then they fall. So then you can identify who's there. Uh, we don't do this, so in this summer we only did this twice, so generally in terms of making sure you're not impacting the population, you do this at most once a month. Um, but it's a way of seeing what's there. So um, what we found, so these are different uh, taxonomic levels. So in the west wetland, 53 different taxa, getting it at least down to genus, so I don't know if you remember Kimberly. So family, genus, species, so species is the most specific. So at least at the genus level, uh, 43, and then for the East Wetland, 62. Orders, uh, which is a higher taxonomic level, uh, fairly similar. I'm just going to look at one of these orders, the Hymenoptera, which includes the bees, wasps, and, and uh, ants. So for the Hymenoptera, um, this is a sample of what the data is so instead of showing you all. Uh, seven slides like this for all the, the different orders. So in the Hymenoptera, so again, these are the bees, wasps, and ants, um, there were 13 different families represented in West Wetlands, 15 different ones in the East Wetland. One key thing to note is that what's abundant in one wetland is not the same as the other. So they are not the same. And we compared our results to Chicago. So in Chicago, they're doing a whole series of urban bee studies. So we took two of these urban bee studies and looked at, okay, what are the bee families that they're finding compared to what we're finding? <coughs> Most of them are finding some similar things. We didn't find any of these polyester bees, so these, these guys actually line their nests with a clear cellophane kind of switch, so they're called polyester bees. So we didn't find those. But one thing that was really cool, we found bees that are in the um, Lydidae. This is a small bee family, relatively rare. So this, um, <clears throat> these are specialists. So the one, the reason why we picked this up and they didn't in Chicago, is that we have Lysimachia ciliata. So we have three nice patches of this plant over in the West Wetland. Um, it's called fringed yellow loose strife. This has nothing to do with purple loose strife. They're in different families. This is the bad thing with compounds. So anyway, we have Lysimachia ciliata, and it attracts. Um, it, is, it doesn't produce nectar, so it produces these floral oils and pollen. And it gets Micropus nuda, which is an oil bee. And so this bee, I don't know if you can see this beefy back leg that's really, really better. <laughs> so it comes and it collects these oils and it collects pollen. And it feeds its young the oil, a mixture of the oil and the pollen. So it's not forging for nectar. So it's a little unusual in terms of the bees. Most bees are feeding their young nectar. So, we have this rare bee because we have that plant. If you plant it, they will come. <laughs> it's really cool. We've also been out at night, so looking at connections between the wetlands. So one thing that you can do, um, and I just want to point out, these are fireflies. That's so oh. cool. um, <clears throat> Jim is pretty good at taking night photos. So. Anyway, um, so what we do, we have these fluorescent dyes. And you can put dye on all the flowers of a single focal plant and then mark it with um, a flag. And then at night, you go out, so about 10 o'clock at night when it's getting dark, and then you can use a black light and see where has that dye gone. So you check all of the other plants cool. to see if there's any fluorescent dye on them. We have different colors of dye, so we can mark multiple focal plants at the same time. So this requires being up at 5 in the morning and then being out at 10 o'clock at night. Um, we had lots of fun. We will with other people. Um, so one of the things that we look at is um, looking at distance traveled. So you find your focal plant and then measure, okay, where did it 
uh, where did that dye travel to? Um, for the most part, most of these, the dye is transferred very short distances. Um, but Asclepius incarnata, so this is swamp milkweed, this is the longest distance that we, we've recorded, so that was over 350 meters. The distance between the two wetlands is about 230 meters, so this was the movement between the two wetlands. But most of the transfers are very short. And we, at this point, so this is um, data um, collected over two years. Um, we've looked at eight different plant species. The majority of the dye transfers within the pollens, uh, sorry, within the wetlands, and for um, between the wetlands, we've really only observed this for the milkweed. Every other species, it's just within the wetlands. And if you look at, this is further supported when we compare the community similarities. So the Jacquard's index ranges from 0 to 1, or 100%. So 0 means no similarity. 100 means 100% similarity in terms of presence absence. 24% similarity in insects. So, so these two wetlands are like two different things. They're not that far apart, but we're not getting a lot of movement between the two. So one of the things that we've been thinking about um, is sort of increasing this way. Mm -hmm. Increasing this way. So we can decrease the gap because if you have small populations, you can have problems with inbreeding, not enough genetic diversity. So trying to increase connectivity. Okay. So the last <coughs> part of the talk, we're going to come back to campus. So we work over the river. Now we're coming back to this side. Um, and in general, um, non-native plants are used in landscape. And so at least 5,000 non-native plant species have been introduced to the U.S. largely for landscaping purposes. Um, and we define non-native as plants that have been introduced from elsewhere. So Kentucky bluegrass is from Europe, it's not from here. Dandelions from Europe, not here. Um, Native species are those that have historically occurred within this region, pre-settlement. So spring beauty and goldenrod. Um, and then invasive species are species that are not normally part of the ecosystem and are actually causing harm. So you can be have a non-native species that's there, bluegrass, but not causing a lot of harm. But then you have things like a myrrh honeysuckle that definitely fall into the invasive. Um, so one of the things that matters about native plants is their chemistry. Almost everything in life is really like chemistry. <laughs> and the um, plants, each plant has a whole suite of chemicals within it. That affects who can eat it. So there's plant chemistry and then the animal diets. Um, and some of these relationships are really specific. So for example, yuccas and yucca moss. So we have yucca plants that are in some of our um, parking lot islands that are out in the north side. Um, and these yucca plants in the spring, well, so in June, they get visited by these yucca moths that lay their eggs in the ovary, um, the eggs hatch, and then these larvae can only eat these seeds. If they don't have those seeds, they're dead. There's only one thing in the world they can eat. That's highly special. Um, and we know, so for a lot of these plant-insect interactions, we don't know how old they are. This one is a very well-studied system. We know from molecular clock data that it dates to at least 40 million years old. So this is a long partnership. The mycorrhizal partnerships, that was fossil record, we know at least that extends 300 million years. So these specialist arthropods can't survive on non-native plants. Maybe that's not surprising. But even if you look at these generalists, so, so monarchs are another example of specialists. So these monarch caterpillars can only feed on Asclepius. There's about 107 species of these milkweeds, Asclepius. But that's all they can eat. You give them something else, they're dead. But Luna moths, which we also have on campus, these are generalists. So they can feed on birch, leaves from birch trees, walnut, hickories, sumac. And those are in four different plant families. So that's a relatively broad diet. So these are considered generalists. So um, this study here, this was done by Ptolemy, who's an entomologist. He reared uh, these yucca moth larvae on their native host plants. So sweet gum is one of those native host plants. 
Um, and then also 14 other non-native plants that were within that same environment. And on, after 15 days, um, the yucca, or sorry, the luna moth larvae uh, grew to almost 2.5 grams, dead on all of those. They grew a little bit on the horealism, which is a horticultural plant, but basically this is a death sentence. If you've only grown to 0.5 grams in 15 days, you're dead as a larva. So the generalists can't survive on these non native plants. Mm -hmm. So Tony and I did a study um, where we were interested in, uh, basically the hypothesis was that if you have an area with native plants, does it support more arthropods and then more bird species? So looking at higher trophic levels. And we focused on, does small scale matter? Do you have to do these large scale restorations to have a difference? Or can you do small scale and, and make a difference? So parking lot islands, education and arts building <coughs> over that way. If you haven't been there, I highly recommend it. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so when they built the education and arts building, some of the parking lot islands have native plants and then some are kind of remnants um, and have ornamental plants. So we paired these up, so we had uh, six pairs of the um, parking lot islands with the horticultural plants and the six with uh, native. We did not use, this. Was, we didn't think this was a fair comparison, so we did not use any parking lot island that looked like this. So one of the things that we know is that birds pay attention a lot to vertical structure. So on average, um, for both of these categories, there was on average two trees, two small trees um, for that. So we tried to keep that the same because we know that matters to birds. And then we chose parking lot islands that had some horticultural plants, that things that were flowering. So we compared arthropod uh, diversity and abundance, floral visitors, <coughs> birds, in those two kinds of parking lots. Um, to sample the arthropods, we used uh, those solo yellow bowls, which are actually really hard to find. Um, they attract wasps, so I think people have stopped using them in picnics. Uh. <laughs> I've got a hundred of them, so if you ever need yellow, I've got that color. Mostly they only sell blue, red, and white now. Um, but the yellow is important because it attracts, so again, arthropod vision. So the yellow attracts uh, the arthropods. So you put a little bit of water at the base. So this is on the ground. So we're collecting any arthropod that's in the area, a little bit of soap, and then you can see what's come. Um, this is looking at abundance. So the native parking lot, um, parking islands had twice as many arthropods compared to non -native. In terms of floral visitors, so we used the same method that, um, we, that Sarah and I did with the other study. Um, so this is looking at floral visitors. So there were significantly more floral visitors in the native plant areas compared to non-native plant areas. And then the most astounding thing is the birds. So I wasn't expecting to see any difference in the birds. But Tony liked birds. This is why you do work with students. They have different interests than so, uh, so the birds, so um, eight of the species were present in both of the parking lot types. Um, the diet, so herbivores and omnivores, native, two non-native species there. But then the parking lot islands that had the native plants, they picked up four more species. And interestingly, two of these species, their diet is mostly insectivores. Mm -hmm. They eat insects. So... In terms of bird species richness, it was significantly greater in the parking lot islands with the native plants compared to not. Abundance, 400 <coughs> birds in the native areas versus not. We're talking parking lot islands over here. Small scale matters. It makes a difference. So arthropod abundance was higher. There were more floral visitors. Bird abundance four times higher. It matters what we plant. There was an interesting study that came out just this last year, um, and they were comparing, so you can, you can go to garden centers and you can buy native plants, but they're cultivars of the native plants. So they've been bred so that they have usually darker, redder leaves, they have showier flowers or different colors <coughs> of flowers. So in this study, they looked at 64 coniferin species. So these are bugs that suck 
juice out of the leaves, like leaf hoppers, aphids, and so forth. There's a lot of femipterans in the world. Um, <clears throat> this is an example of a femipteran up here. Um, so over 50%, so they paired up these cultivars. So this is a uh, bee balm, Leonardo fistulosa. So this is a cultivar. And then this is the wild propagated variety here. Over 50% of these mepterans preferred wild propagated plants over the cultivars. These are genetically <coughs> really, really similar. But the difference in the chemistry of the leaf, the differences in the flowers can make a difference. Now in some cases, some of these cultivar differences between the cultivar and the wild propagated hasn't shown a difference, but sometimes it does matter. So when you're doing um, native plant restorations, whenever possible, I would recommend use the wild propagated. Um, so this was actually a study from NASA um, doing satellite studies. So they were able to estimate <coughs> how much of the United States is covered in lawn. It's a lot three times more than any irrigated crop. This is dead space. It's not supporting crops. So sometimes you need grass. If you're playing soccer, you need grass. But um, what I would argue is that you can use residential and urban landscapes as a really powerful conservation tool for supporting uh, biodiversity. Restorations aren't perfect, as I've already said. It's actually really hard to capture the full diversity that you see in the remnants. So we need the remnants too. But in urban areas, we can really make a difference. The other point that I, I've really focused here on biodiversity, but these um, landscaping also makes a difference in terms of how much water runoff. We've also done studies of the trees on campus in terms of how much carbon storage, carbon uptake, and also how they purify the air reducing water runoff. So those are called ecosystem services. So it matters at that level. So these are my acknowledgments. I have a number of collaborators. Um, funding sources, Kirk, awesome till. <laughs> <laughs> Although you have to have a lot of muscles to use it. Uh, Tom Clark helped with the insect identification, so his expertise is more involved. Uh, and then also, I want to shout out to the facilities people, Adam Label, absolutely amazing. We are able to do these projects because they allow us to. Um, and if you don't know about the regulation of planting things on campus, ask, because it's there. So anyway, I'll end there and open it up for questions. to see the facilities people on there yes are they working with you to yes. to maybe change oh. what they put in the parking lot <laughs> islands and things like that I mean I, I would have hoped that they would have consulted you before they put but no I know better than we that. we work really hard <laughs> and almost every opportunity we remind them please ask so things mm -hmm. happen things uh, happen overnight um, so we're working on it. We, we okay. try to keep, but um, but you have some inroads yes. there. That's yeah. great. And actually, this next week. So this is actually part of our tree campus. Uh, but uh, through that, we're establishing better ties with uh, James Mason. A lot of these decisions get made down in Virginia. Yeah. So there's yes. architects. They they have decided for the next five years what's going to be planted, where trees are going to be planted on campus. So we're trying to shift the conversation to what trees will be planted and trying. But they are open to it. It's just Good. a matter of you have to yeah. really work at it consistently and remind them. Because this is not their priority. Mm -hmm. It's my priority. Mm -hmm. but yeah. That's why they should let you help them. Yeah. Well, I don't necessarily want to be in charge of campus lands. No. <laughs> but um, anyway, but we are, uh, we are definitely in Good. communication. And Adam is, has been. You have this um, Jakar index between oh, yeah, yeah. these two wetlands. Mm -hmm. Why do you understand why this is so dramatically different? It's sort of for mm -hmm. for a lay person, it's sort of very surprising that mm -hmm. they are so dramatically different. Why yeah. is that? Um, part of it has to do with there are actually <coughs> different plant species between the west and the east. 
um, but the other thing, you can actually kind of see it in, um, so I just showed one slide for one order, so the Hymenoptera. Um, so we've got some of the same families, but which ones are most abundant in each area differs. So each color here is representing a different family. So I think most of it's being driven in terms of why they're just different is that you have different plant species that are coming up. We do have some overlap because we were able to look at dye transfer between the two, but there's actually, it's partly the plant communities are different. The other thing that I should say between the two wetlands, we've had different things come up. So in, if I go back to the very first diagram, The plants migrate, they don't stay put. Oh, they, well, they haven't migrated a lot in this time period. Too short. Um, so these are different habitats. This one gets regularly flooded from the river. Mm. This one, so it got flooded last year. But uh, in general, this one doesn't get direct input from the river. Uh, so the habitats are really pretty different. This one has a berm, so this green, so this is the wetland area. This is a berm here. So we actually have dry species up here where this is all floodplain. So part of it, the plant communities are different. But it is pretty amazing. They're pretty close. Yet remarkably different. Yeah, maybe sort of related to that. How much did you look at um, soil and what the, all these past uses have done to the contaminants in the soil and things like that? Does that affect the, what the data of the... So uh, we did do... So um, in that very first year, 2017, we did look at nutrients in the soil. Um, I didn't look at toxins, the heavy metals in the soil, so for that we'd have to send it out to Purdue Ag to do that kind of work. Um, which would probably be good to do because we're spending a lot of time working in the soil. Um, and the things that probably would have contaminated it would have been that NASCAR racetrack because this is leaded gasoline. So that was automobiles on horses. This is automobiles, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So there's probably lead, um, and who knows what else. But we haven't tested that. And does that affect? The so that would be a toxin that could affect uh, plant species, but it's also killing the micro. It's also affecting the microbes in the soil. So if you can restore the microbes in the soil, you can probably get the plants to do stuff. How easily could a uh, property owner in our region who had the appropriate sort of little piece of land find the advice they needed to make it into something a little nicer? Um, there's a couple of places. So there's a local group called IMPAWS, so Indiana Native <coughs> and Wildflower Society. Um, and they are focused in the northern region in terms of doing um, restorations. South of campus, uh, so it's down by Potato Creek, but there's a naturally native nursery, and they do wild propagated plants, and that's an excellent place source for native plants. Um, I would avoid Lowe's and Home Depot for two reasons. One is that you're more likely to get cultivars that may not do what you want. But secondly, they use neonicotinoids, um, which persist in the plants, which also kill in particular pollinators. So um, source matters. So uh, naturally native nursery that's south. Uh, there's also um, some online. So we do a lot through Prairie Moon, which is over in Wisconsin, um, in Minnesota. Um, and so establishing, um, yeah. And I would start small. So actually I have, uh, let's just go to the very um, so this is a garden setting. So you can do however you want to. So this is more garden setting. This is our front yard, part of our front yard. Um, and we've converted our front yard all to natives. There's still some grass each year. We kind of go out a little bit. We go at it slow, mainly because there's a limit to how much time I can spend gardening versus other things. Um, but uh, mostly in our yard, we're going for diversity because I I'm interested in that, but you don't have to. You can focus on just a few things. I've got a present for somebody. If somebody wants bee balm, I've got a packet of seeds there. Is that your backyard? 
This is our friend. <laughs> oh, the other picture, though. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> when I started, so what drew me to ecology was actually working in places like this. So I started places where you have to hike, you know, 40 minutes to get there, really large. And, and I'm also working with land trusts to help preserve these areas. Um, and I have <coughs> long-term projects out in Colorado. Um, but what I've come to appreciate is that the small scale matters too. We need both. And I think these campus studies have been really nice and kind of shown that it does make a difference. So the answer is yes, we can do it. And I can, I would be happy to point anybody towards more resources for seeds. When's the best time of year to begin doing the small scale, like in your yard? This spring would be a great time. So one thing that you could do right now is, if your yard doesn't flood, um, is to put out black plastic, weight it down so that will kill the grass, and then you can just put either plugs. Plugs goes faster than seeds, but you can do either. So actually now, spring, fall and spring is a good time to plant for natives. When you say spring, is that like February, March, April? Yeah, so, so I think of February is spring. Uh, so February to April. Because you're getting a lot of water, a bad time to plant is in the summer. We have less rain in July. You get a lot of failures if you start in July. I, I want to say that um, my uh, sustainability MLS class um, had fun planting some pawpaw seeds in some of the areas near the dorms. And um, I'm wondering. Uh, you know, what opportunities um, you might envision for community-engaged classes working on um, native plant restoration? There, there's a lot of opportunities, um, and we can do both campus and then also elsewhere. So there's uh, work days within the community in terms of mostly removing invasives. Mm -hmm. uh, so we actually have a lot of invasive removal on campus as well. Uh, but yeah, we'd be happy to on campus engage more classes if you want to include that in your classes in some way. Um, I have a question uh, about the work you're doing with students in terms of, if you go back to the slide about counting, uh, counting scores, and I was, I was noticing, <laughs> that I'm just thinking about time. Oh, yeah. it, <laughs> the, so it was two tablespoons of salt. This was two teaspoons, and then the second one was tablespoon. So in this one, we quantified actually not only number of spores, but we also quantified size of the spores and color of the spores. I didn't present all of that. So, um, so that hours. took time. Yeah. How many hours? Yeah. Well, so this was, um, so one of the things that we developed in biology is a summer intensive research course. Okay. We team teach it, so uh, in the summertime, David, Wilkes, Andy, and I have team taught it four times now. And so um, we have them every morning for four hours. Um, and then with the LSAMP project, so that was last summer, that was 30 hours a week. Uh, and so yeah, counting, you get good at counting. There are, there are methods for counting fast, so we have quickers and that kind of thing. Yeah, we're good at counting. No, I was just thinking for each of those figures. Yeah. It would be kind of nice to have the you know first and hours. <laughs> oh, well, so actually the floral observations. Um, that is uh, that's very time intensive, and that's data that we're kind of collecting slowly over time. Um, yeah, I have a question about that one. With each one, was it the same number of hours observed? Yes. Okay. So what we did so is we did 15 for, minute okay. observations um, <clears throat> every day for that. Now there was a little bit difference in um, because some of the plants had shorter flowering times, some right. longer. So we had, but the number of observations that reflects the number of times we saw a floral observer. But it was within each plant, yeah, it was controlled the number of times. So each observer, 15 minutes, and then you moved on to the next patch. And we rotated around and we randomly did the order so that in case it matters that you start here versus there. So there's a whole, yeah, there's a whole set of protocols about how you So it's cost prohibitive to just 
set a GoPro. Mm -hmm. um, I'd be worried about the, so the size that we're looking at. We're not looking yeah. at deer. Because um, <laughs> <laughs> these things are really, really small. Yeah. And if you <laughs> aim right at a flower <laughs> like that, like I don't know how. Yeah, you're right. If you eyes are amazing. Them. Cameras are terrible. We well, okay. don't appreciate eyesight. You can see so much. The fact that David caught this with a cell phone. I would think the opposite, that the eyes would just get tired and you're looking at it for so long, it's like... I, you have way better depth perception okay. with your eyes. Cameras are... We evolved to do this. This is how we survive for... Yeah. You know. I have a teaching question, Deb. So I have a hard time, certain times of the semester, getting my students even from the class. But you have students out looking for bees at, from 7 to 9 a.m. every morning. Five in the morning. Five in the night. morning and yeah. 10 at night. How do you, um, how, what is the Biology motivational students. factor? Are these super excited biologists, future biologists, who want to sacrifice their entire social life and personal life in order to social It's the birds, it's the bees. I mean, come on. <laughs> So here's the interesting thing. So uh, when we, uh, so like with that L391 class, which is a class, then you get a mix of motivation. Mm. Um, but in general, once you get them into it, and actually those students that I was showing, so one of them is going to become a physician assistant, another one um, is going into pre physical therapy. So they're not all go ahead. Back from the tour. Yeah, so sometimes I, I get them into it after a while. But honestly, once you get people outside and yeah. looking, um, yeah, I don't know, it works for the most part. But yeah, there are sometimes students, and you have to be really careful with the data, so you have to double check the quality of the data all the time. This requires a lot of one-on-one -on -one monitoring to make sure the data set that you get at the end is I was just going to say, they're probably all 10 on the conservation scale, and they have great spike fidelity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The suits? Yes. But, but in general, um, yeah, and we try to get them early, so especially, um, yeah, we try to get them after that first year of biology, intro biology, early on. But I think it's pretty clear up front, like they show up to class and you're like, listen, you're going to be out there doing this stuff and now's your chance. <laughs> yeah, I've or never had anybody clear. quit, but um, yeah, we do make it clear. Now, the, when we're doing the, the night time at the early morning, 5 and then 10 in the evening, okay, they've got crazy schedules, they work, they're yeah. from an hour away. Uh, so there are issues there. Uh, but, you know, they, they almost always make a, an effort and fundamentally I think they're interested. So actually, we're starting uh, to put up uh, bat boxes, and that's going to require a night monitoring. Ooh. But we've got people that are interested in bats. So well, I was impressed when people were out after dark looking at my yucca plants. Oh, yeah. Like, oh, we, uh, wow. So Krista has a fabulous yucca patch in her yard. So, Lots of moths. Yeah. So in the spring, or sorry, in June, and we often crash her yard, in addition to the parks. So you don't buddy them up so the morning person does the five and the evening person does the ten. They have you to need to do both because you have to know where all the plants are. Sleep is a bit. <laughs> <laughs> so Wayne, how, how long ago did you visit us? I was wondering if there's a correlation between you know, how those, plant, those two plants that come out that have more global visitors. Do they have, do they have something that's a similar with them to start of how they appear physically or chemical composition? That's a really good question. These are in completely different plant families, very different flowers. So this is an iris flower, this is a monocot. Um, and then uh, they do have a lot of nectar deep within the iris. Um, and then a sclevia, so this is a milkweed, so this is more of an humble kind of flower. Um, this also produces, I guess, quite a bit of nectar as well. It requires, mostly bees are the only ones that can pollinate this. The pollination mechanism of this is pretty cool. You have to pick out a little thread with two pollinia on it. So a small subset of these are actually pollinating. And for the irises, you have to have a muscle hand to kind of <laughs> work its way down to the base actually pollinate. So a subset of those floral visitors are actually 
pollinating. And that's why I'm very careful to say floral visitors because it's a whole other level of work to determine who's pollinating. But those are two different very plant species, different, completely different families, flowering at different times. The bird study that you did with yeah. the um, Parthenops, is that the piece that was going in for publication? Yeah, yeah, so that was, uh, actually that was just recently accepted, yeah. So is there anything you can plant to get rid of the geese? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> mow mo less. <laughs> so they don't like tall grass. Uh, so um, this is one argument that we have for why we should expand. Yeah. Yeah. Unless yeah. there will be less geese on the sidewalk, which is an issue. They are an issue. I'm so glad that you said that. What's that? And mow less. Yeah. Well, in general, like that. Yeah. that's why I'm mowing grass. Mow less, mow less, mow less, mow less, mow less <laughs> and mow less. Yeah. That obedient plant, is that one of the ones where you would have to be careful about cultivars versus native plants? Yes, yeah, so this one you can get cultivar varieties. There's cultivars of Bohemian plant, penstemon, and iris. I don't believe there are cultivars of the milkweeds, the cup mm -hmm. plant, or the trads. Oh, well, actually, there might be for the trads. So there are different colors. Yeah, there are. Okay. okay. Uh, but yeah, the Obedium plant. Um, and in general, so I would say the jury's still out. So in some cultivars, it doesn't matter. But for some, it does. And I think the general rule of thumb that I'm seeing so far if it has funny colored leaves, not green, it's probably mm -hmm. going to make a difference. Mm -hmm. If they've made the flower showier, mm -hmm. if it's prettier for humans, don't do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a technical question yeah. about the fluorescent dyes that you put on plants and so you can see it dying. Yeah. So do they get washed off? Uh, how yes. long do they last on the plant? Not very long. So as soon as it rains, they're gone. So we have to time very carefully when we do it. It ha has to be a day that it's not going to rain. Um, humidity matters. Temperature matters. Uh, so part of the reason why we have relatively few observations, partly it's coordinating schedules, but partly it's you have to have good weather conditions to do it. I think it, uh, indoor microbiologists, uh, we also have to watch humidity when we do experiments. Yeah. Uh, uh, sometimes in summertime, the building can be very humid, and as soon as you open up the bottle, it just sucks all the moisture, and then next time you see the powder become a well, big chunk. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah.